I get the opportunity of this morning of bringing the word. Uh, Pastor Rick says hello. He's in Florida for some board meetings, and so he is having a great time. But he says hello, and uh, he will be back next week for our 40th anniversary. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Noah. I'm the student ministries and young adults pastor here at The Rock. And so I get the pleasure of hanging out with all of our youth students and uh, our young adults as well. And so, uh, but over the last probably number of weeks, we've been in a series uh, called Learning to Live Like Jesus. And we've spent a number of weeks on 1 Corinthians 13 uh, and, and breaking down basically the love chapter, if you will. And, and Pastor Rick has done a phenomenal job of just breaking it down. And we're going to continue that this morning. And I'm so excited to do that with you this morning. But would you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13? And I'm going to read verse 4 and the, the verses we've been studying so far. And it says this. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And here's where we're going to focus today in verse 6. It says, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Let's read that again. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to just come and to be in your presence this morning. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through me. I pray that we would hear your words and your voice clearly. God, would they not just be my own opinions or ideas, but would it be uh, just vision and, and something that we hear directly from your throne room this morning. And so we just pray we would leave here encouraged in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, as I was praying and studying about this specific verse, the Lord began to just kind of reveal to my heart that in this specific verse, there are two attitudes. There are two attitudes. You have somebody that rejoices at wrongdoing, and then you have the attitude of somebody who rejoices with the truth. And as I began to think about that, I just began to kind of hear the Lord say, man, there's, there are two different kinds of attitudes that we can have, and I want to talk to you about those this morning. The first attitude is this, the attitude of an accuser, somebody who rejoices with wrongdoing, loves to go and find the things that are going wrong, loves to go and nitpick and loves to go and do all these things. But then there's the, the attitude of an advocate, somebody who's willing to stand for the truth regardless of what the truth is. They just want truth to win out. And I think part of it is as we as the church have maybe kind of gotten a little too righteous, if you want to call it that, where we, we begin to stand on the word and we begin to point the finger, but we're not trying to point out the truth for truth's sake. We're trying to point out the truth so it makes us feel better. We become an accuser because there's stuff that we haven't dealt with and there's stuff that's going on in our life and we want us to feel good, so we begin to point the finger. But I believe Jesus wants to remind us of how he sees us this morning and how we can fight the attitude of an accuser with the attitude of an advocate. And I want to look at a specific story in the Bible because here's what we know about the truth. John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Sometimes the truth doesn't feel good. Can I get an amen? It doesn't feel good. But yet in that moment, because truth is winning out, there's something being broken in our life that is taking us to the next level. There's something being broken in our life that is taking us closer to Jesus. You see, we should want the truth to win out because that means lives are being changed and transformed and set free by Jesus. And I want to look at a specific story in John chapter 8 where Jesus shows us that. John chapter 8 verse 1 says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. I haven't been following Jesus that long. I've been following Jesus for a while. But one thing I have learned is it's not wise to test Jesus. It never works out in the way we think it's going to work out. 
Normally when we're trying to test Jesus, it's because we actually kind of know that we're wrong, but we're trying to, you know, get away around it. And Jesus says, no, that's, that's not how we're going to roll. And I love what Jesus does here. It says, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who was without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You see, in this passage of Scripture, you see two different attitudes. You see the attitude from the Pharisees of an accuser trying to point the finger, saying, hey, Jesus, check this out. She done messed up. She was caught in adultery. We actually caught her. And in the law of Moses, it says we should stone her. So what do you say? And I love what Jesus does. Because in this moment, Jesus doesn't just stand with the Pharisees and say, you're right. She did get caught in adultery. We should stone her. No, that's not what he did. He didn't immediately grab the woman and say, you're okay. You can keep doing that. Life is good. No, Jesus knelt down and began to ride in the, in the dirt. And to this day, I, I, I can't wait to get to heaven and go, Jesus, what'd you write? What was it? Because it doesn't say, and I like to know things, and I want to know what you wrote. And it was actually funny. I was having a dialogue with Pastor Rick about it. Because I'm like, dude, what did he write? I studied it. No one knows what he wrote. And Pastor Rick goes, well, I don't know this. He's like, I can only guess. But he's like, my guess is that he wrote their sins in the dirt. And that's why he stood up and he said, hey, you who is without any of the sins that I just wrote in the dirt, go ahead and throw the first stone. Go ahead. Try it. And then he knelt down again and began to write, and they began to walk away one by one. You see, I love what Jesus did here. He stood for both parties. Why? Because he brought truth to the Pharisees to say, hey, you have sin in your life, so you don't have a place to accuse. But yet at the same moment, he stood for the woman who was caught in the heinous act of adultery. And he says, hey, no one's condemned you, so neither do I. My grace is sufficient, and go and sin no more. You see, he stood for both. Why? Because Jesus desires that the truth wins out, regardless of what the truth is. You see, the Pharisees thought they were doing something good. Oh, Jesus, look at, look at me. Look who I went and caught sinning. And Jesus goes, look who I just caught sinning. <laughs> gotcha. He stood for both people. But we see the attitude of an accuser versus the attitude of an advocate. And I want to just focus really quick on just the attitude of an accuser. What are some of the things that we can have? What are the things in our life? And trust me, this has not made my week very fun. Because the last thing I want to do is come and preach to you and not first go through it and say, hey, Lord, is there anything in me that needs to come out? And as I began to ask the Lord, I just like, Lord, what's, what are some of the things? What are traits of an accuser? Well, an accuser is always looking to set a trap. I don't seems like the Pharisees were, number one, trying to set a trap for Jesus. They wanted him to say something so they could bring charges against him, so they could arrest him, kill him, get him off the street, and get him off their back. An accuser wants to go set a trap and try to trap people. An accuser loves to gossip. How many of us enjoy gossip a little too much? Trust me, that is, gossip is something that is difficult for me, if I can be honest. Because I'm very passionate, and I have a lot of opinions. And sometimes I just have to take a lesson from one of my old pastors, and he just says, raise your strong feeling sign. Shut up and raise your strong feeling sign. I was, I was convicted of that this week. Areas where I should have kept my mouth shut and I didn't. And I had to repent for those things. An accuser loves to point the finger. 
Why? Because they don't, they, don't, they don't want people looking at them and pointing out their problems. They just want to go point out other people's problems. And this is what I love to tell our youth when they, they like to point the finger. So you know when you point the finger, you have three pointing back at you. You're outnumbered when you point the finger. And then they like try to get really wise and they go, yeah, that's why you point like this. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but then there's a problem. You're focusing on other people and not your own crap in your own life. You see, we have, we have to be able to point the finger at ourselves first. We have to be people that it's going gonna, it's gonna to go to me first, and then, and then we can go deal with somebody else. Why? That's how the Bible tells us to do it. Matthew 7, verse 3. It says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but uh, do not notice the log that is in your eye? Notice how it's a speck in somebody else's eye, but it's a log in your own eye. Probably means that you're being a little nitpicky about the little things, and there's big things going on in your life that you're trying to cover up, that you're trying to hide, and the Lord says, no, let's bring that to the surface and let's deal with that so then you can go help somebody with the speck in their eye. He goes on to say, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when there is a big log in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Listen, God wants you to see clearly And if we don't deal with the stuff in our own life, we will always point the finger and want to deal with other people's junk. But God says, no, would you you point here first? Would Would you allow me to come in? And would you allow me to show up? So those are some of the traits. What about some of the symptoms? What are some of the symptoms of being an accuser? Wrong beliefs. You believe everything else is wrong, but yet you're good. You believe your problem isn't that big, but if you actually look at it, it's a pretty big deal. What else? Maybe you have a short fuse. Maybe you get easily angered. I'm passionate. I have an issue with getting angry in an instant sometimes, if I'm just being honest. Sometimes it's hard. I get frustrated. Anybody get frustrated with me? I relate to Pastor Rick really well when he starts talking about people cutting him off on the freeway. I relate really well to that, just being real. Cut me off, what are you doing? Lay on the horn. Make sure I'm driving a car that doesn't have any of the rock logo on it. You're like pulling in front of him. You got a bumper sticker on the back of your car. Oh, dang it. Here's one symptom. Do you get excited when you watch other people's lives falling apart? Do you get excited about gossip? Do you love making other people feel less than because your life is so messed up you want people to feel less than because your life is in shambles so other people's life needs to be in shambles? Man, our society, if I'm being honest, is way too good at that. We have TV shows about it. We have TV shows about people's lives being torn apart. Can I be honest? Strong feelings. I hate that show. Those shows make me angry. Why? Because people's lives are falling apart and we're standing around celebrating it and laughing at it and making jokes about it. Can I be real? Sometimes we even do it to famous people because we think, well, that doesn't matter, they're famous. I'm never gonna meet them. You don't know that. I used to work at a Starbucks drive-thru. Do you know how many famous people I met? A couple. (laughs) Not a lot, but a couple. Got to meet Tony Parker from the San Antonio Spurs. Praise God. I met a pitcher from the Boston Red Sox. And I would literally watch people get so excited when they would meet them. And I was just like, hey, Tony Parker loves hot chocolate. Josh Beckett got four grande caramel frappuccinos and a grande skinny vanilla latte. Don't ask me how I remember that, but it's stuck in my head. 
Listen, just because they get paid a lot of money to be in movies or to play sports doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't want to reveal himself to them and show them how much he loves them. But yet we stand around going, oh, did you see so-and-so? Oh, they did this and they did that and they did this and they did that. We should stand for them too. If we get a little too excited about TMZ, we should check ourselves about that. Why? Because we shouldn't celebrate people's lives crumbling. It should actually grieve our heart. And we should want to do something about it. So how? How do we fight the attitude of an accuser? I believe the way to fight the attitude of an accuser is to fight it with the attitude of an advocate. What does that mean? How do we change the way we see people? We change the way we think about people. We even have to change the way we think about ourselves. And we have to see ourselves differently. And there's two things that I want to focus on as we get ready to close. And I said yes, close, because we had a lot going on in our service today. So this is quick. Number one, receive forgiveness. Receive forgiveness. So many of us get caught up in our own sin and in our own junk and in our own crap in our life that we can never see past it. And every time we see ourselves in the mirror, all we see is our past. We don't see God's grace. We don't see his mercy. We don't see us how he sees us. I love that song we sing that has amazing grace in it. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time, Jesus died for you and for me. I don't know about you, but I don't think any of us were around 2,000 years ago. If I'm doing the math, based on how long people live, ain't none of us there. But it said at the right time, Jesus died for the ungodly. Who was the ungodly? You and me. Listen, I came into this world going to church. Was I still ungodly? Yes. Yes. Why? Because I hadn't said yes to Jesus yet. Listen, all of us, the Bible says it very clear that we have all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. But we've all been saved by grace. So we have to walk in his his forgiveness, but we have to walk in his grace. John 1, 16 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace, upon grace grace upon grace it's not from his fullness we received grace until we outran it until we messed up too many times until we made too many bad decisions no his grace is sufficient and it is grace upon grace which means it never runs out listen I don't know where you're at this morning but I'm here to tell you you can't outrun God's grace on your life You can't outrun it. You can resist it, but you can't outrun it. And listen, I hope that this morning you would stop running and you would say yes to God's grace for you this morning. That you would walk out of here so grace-filled that when people encounter you, they would see grace. Why? Because when we received and we have this this epiphany and this realization of how great God is and how great the gift of forgiveness and grace and mercy that we have received, it should cause us to do something crazy. It should cause us to do something insane. Why? Because we want to show Jesus how grateful we are. We want to show Jesus how grateful we are for his gift of grace and mercy, and I love Luke chapter seven, where we actually get a picture of this. In verse 36, it says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, 
She began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. The Pharisees love to point out people's issues and to point out people's problems, but yet she didn't care because all she wanted was Jesus and she just wanted to show Jesus how grateful she was for his grace. Why? Because you don't know when, but as I study this, it was one of the reasons they say that she came was because she encountered an earlier teaching and it changed her life. This was a woman who, let's just say, she was the woman of the night. She got around a little bit. But yet she encountered somebody that changed everything. And she says, all I want to do is show him how thankful I am. But I love this. In that moment, she came to find him. But in that moment, what did she have? She had another epiphany of all the things that she had done that she had been forgiven for. And what did it do? It caused her to weep. And notice her place. It says that she was behind Jesus. She knew she was forgiven, but she still didn't think of herself high and mighty. She thought of herself as lowly. And if it was just to wash his feet, that would be enough. If it was just to wash the feet of Jesus, it would be enough. We don't need the seat at the table. Just let me wash his feet. I just want to show him how grateful I am. Why? We, we have to receive his forgiveness. But the second thing is this. We have to put on the lens of Jesus. We have to begin to see people the way Jesus sees people. And I, and, I, and I love, I absolutely love this story because the greatest thing about it is it doesn't end with the woman just washing his feet. Again, just like in John chapter eight, it comes back to Jesus standing for what's right. And I love this in Luke uh, chapter seven, starting in verse 39, it says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, notice that, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, from whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. You see this dialogue where Simon thought of himself so high and mighty that he said to himself, he thought it. Well, if he was actually a prophet, he would know who was touching her. Because look at me, I'm Simon. I know who she is. I know she's a sinner. She shouldn't be there. She shouldn't be doing that. She should have no right to be in my house. But Jesus, being so good, knew Simon's thoughts. And he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. But I want you to catch this. I'm, I'm a visual guy. Anybody a visual learner in here? I'm a visual learner. Some, some people can just like read it and get it. I'm like, um, I read it and go, can someone show me how to do this? I don't know. But I want you to see what happened, and I'm going to invite my buddy Matt up on the stage because I want to show you what happened in this scenario. And as we do, my homie Matt is going to play the character of Simon, even though Matt's a great guy. Simon, he's learning, but Matt's a great guy. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to be put in, in the place of the woman at Jesus' feet. And I want us to understand what Jesus did in this moment. Because check this out. They're reclining, chilling, eating food. She shows up and begins to wash his feet. 
Simon has his arrogant thoughts and Jesus, Jesus being so good, answered him saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And I want you to catch, church, what he did next. Jesus turned. And he faced the woman. But the entire time, he's still talking to Simon. Jesus said, you judge rightly, turning towards the woman. I want you to imagine if you were with Jesus in this moment, Jesus turning towards you. Jesus turned towards the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins. Listen, Jesus identifies with her in this moment. He says, which are many. Looking at her to say, hey, I know. I know your past. I know, I know what you've done. So he says that her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, listen, this is, in this point in the story, this is the first time that Jesus actually talks to the woman. And he says, your sins are forgiven. The woman who came in, whose life was in shambles, she was a prostitute, she got around all the time, encountered Jesus and it changed her life. And all she wanted to do was show Jesus how grateful she was. But listen, Jesus wasn't just about her. Again, Jesus isn't just about proving one person right. He wants both parties to win. And he's talking to Simon, saying, Simon, you've got wrong thoughts about this. Simon, are you kidding me? What's wrong with you? He talks to Simon, but then he turns. And now he's standing in the gap between Simon and the woman. Now Jesus is standing in the gap between every accuser in your life and he's looking at you, speaking to your accuser, saying, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? You, did, you didn't do this, but she's doing this. You didn't kiss me when I came through your door, but she has yet to cease kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she's anointing my feet with ointment. Why? Because those who have been, give, been forgiven much will love much. And what Jesus is saying to Simon, Simon, you can't see her through your own eyes. Because listen, our human eyes, we see mistakes. We see, we see past. We see all the wrong stuff. But what Jesus says is, hey, I don't see her that way. You need to put on my lens. You need to see her through my eyes. And you need to see her as forgiven. Why? Because Jesus would come in here and look at every single one of you and say, hey, Anybody that's trying to accuse you, anybody that's trying to talk bad about you, anybody that's trying to tear you down, he would stand in the gap and say, hey, buddy, do you see this person? Their sins, which are many, are forgiven. Their sins, which are many, are forgiven. Why? Because my grace is sufficient. And in the same way in John chapter 8, all the accusers left and Jesus was standing with the woman. He 
said, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, she said, no one, Lord. And he said, so neither do I. Go and sin no more. Why was Jesus able to tell this woman who was caught in adultery to go and sin no more? Because she encountered grace. Because grace had an opportunity to change her life. My question to you this morning is how many of us are like Simon? Going, well, if they only knew that what they had did, if they only knew what they did. But instead of putting on the lens of Jesus to say, no, first I see me as forgiven. And because I've been forgiven, I'm going to choose to love much and I'm going to see you as forgiven too. Matt, you can go ahead and take a seat. Give it up for Matt. Jesus turned around and stood in the gap for you and for me. So that we could be seen as blameless and whole. Why? So we can go show others how much Jesus loves them by seeing them blameless and whole with a gift of grace and mercy just waiting at the door of their heart to let it in. That's what God wants to do through you. That's what God wants to do through every single one of us. He wants people to encounter his grace and mercy. Listen, he doesn't, he doesn't enjoy injustice. He does not enjoy wrongdoing. But oh man, you better believe Jesus celebrates when the truth wins out. Why? Because he wants people to be set free. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? There's two groups of people I want to talk to as we get ready to close. Number one, if you're in this place and you've never said yes to Jesus, but today you just feel a tugging on your heart, you just feel something inside of you, and today you wanna say yes to that gift of grace, you wanna say yes to that gift of mercy. I'm gonna start on my right, your left. If anybody in here wants to say yes to Jesus, would today be your day? And would you just raise your hand and look at me? My right, your left, far side of the room. Anybody wanna say yes to Jesus today? I'll make my way across. Anybody wanna say yes to Jesus today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just make sure to put your hand up really high so I can see it if you're raising your hand. I'm making my way, my left, your right, the right middle section. Anybody in here want to say yes to Jesus? Want to say yes to grace and mercy this morning? Listen, if your heart's pounding, that's Jesus talking to you. Saying, would you just, would you let me in? Far left, your right. Anybody want to say yes to Jesus today? Thank you, Jesus. Second group of people I want to talk to. Maybe you felt a little convicted this morning. That maybe you've had too much attitude of an accuser in your own heart. You've been pointing the finger a little too much. And today you want to say, you know what? I need to receive the forgiveness that God has given me. And I need to begin to see myself the way he sees me so I can see others the way he sees them. If that's you, I just want to pray for you this morning. So will you just raise your hand and say, yeah, I've had too much accuser in me and I need to get it out. Yeah. Hands up all over the place. Yeah. My hand's up too. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? I want to say, I've, just, I've been accusing way too much, and today's the day that I'm going to receive forgiveness, and I'm going to put on the lens of Jesus this morning. God, I thank you for every hand that is raised. God, I pray that you would begin to show us, Lord, the areas where we have been accusing, the areas that have just been so uh, 
deeply rooted in our hearts where there's hurt or anger or malice or anything that is causing us to be an accuser. God, we stand before you this morning with hearts wide open to say, Jesus, would you come in and would you begin to unroot the the accuser that is in our heart? And God, I pray that you would begin to put back in the attitude of an advocate, somebody that is going to stand for the truth, somebody that is going to stand for what's right, somebody that's going to say, hey, I have been given grace, so I'm going to give grace. God, would we be those people? And Lord, if there's anybody in here that just needs freedom from hurt and pain, I just pray that that would happen right now. If you're in this room and there was something that hurt you, something that is causing pain, somebody, something that is causing anger in your life, would you give it to Jesus this morning? Would you just give it to him? Let him take it. So Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you see us whole and pure and white as snow. And so God, I pray that as we leave today, we would walk in a new confidence as a son and daughter of God. And we would see people the way you see them, as your son and as your daughter, pure and white and whole. White as snow, Jesus, just pure. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. You received that word this morning? Hey, one thing I wanna highlight um, again is just uh, Otinawa. Man, it's because of your generosity and we're so proud of you, church, it's so great. Don't forget, they have a booth out there if you wanna check that out. The other thing is, we have our prayer team right over here to our far right. If you're in a place where you just need prayer, you need somebody to stand with you, that's what they're there for. And, and they wanna do that with you. So if you need prayer, head on over there. But don't forget, also next week is our 40th anniversary. You're gonna to wanna to be here for that. It's gonna be an incredible weekend. We love you. Be blessed.